So what we do here is, um, so we, we fix an isomorphism between the com complex numbers in QP bar. And um, so the, such an isomorphism is extremely discontinuous, but we fix one such, such isomorphism. And when we fix an isomorphism, we can actually view QP as a subalgebra of C. And um, the reason for doing this is now we can, we can uh, define a Hecke algebra. So T sub n is the ZP algebra generated by the endomorphisms um, of, uh, of S2 gamma one event. So the endomorphisms of the B2 plus, uh, B2 plus forms on gamma one event, which is generated by the Hecke operators. So it's the same Hecke operators as before. So T sub L, U sub L, and the diamond operators. So these are Hecke operators. I mean, so they, gen they generate the Z algebra, but we can sort of uh, extend that to ZP algebra. Um, now the point is that the T module Jacobian is the module over the Hecke algebra. Point is that every Hecke operator T gives rise to an endomorphism of the Jacobian. And as a result, it gives rise to an endomorphism of the Hecke module, uh, to, to the, sorry, to the, to the T module. So the T module can be viewed as a module over this Hecke algebra. So now suppose we have our Hecke eigen, eigen form F. So the Hecke eigenform gives us a map from T sub n to O. And what this map does is it just takes our Hecke operator and sends it to the scalar associated to the Hecke operator. So phi of f of t is the scalar such that t act, acts on f by the scalar phi of f of t. So this is just like, um, this, is, this is the map associated to the uh, monitor form phi of f. And then we take the maximum ideal generated by the kernel of phi of f and the uniformizer of it's called that frac of M. And then what we need to do is we need to basically, um, we need to localize the Hecke al al algebra at, at M. And then we do that, we tensor the um, T8 module, localize it M with O, and we get our O lattice. So we get two copies of O when we take this tensor product. The point is that the absolute Galba group acts on, on TP. And as a result, that Galba action sort of gives us a Galba action on this lattice. And that is the uh, Galba condition associated to the monitor form in the weight case. Now, in the higher weight case, the point is that the idea is sort of like uh, generalization of a sort of, it's sort of related to this sort of idea. Um, and uh, instead of using the Jacobian, one uses, you know, etal cohomology instead. But um, that is a subject of not Right now, we just, wanna, we just care about the weight too. Molar forms. Okay. Now, one of the main ingredients um, in the Taylor Wiles method is definition of gap repetitions. And so, this is a theory which was invented by Miser, and um, it sort of was invented in a slightly different context. But the idea here is that by considering definitions of gap repetitions, one can sort of, you know, very formally recover the Hecke algebra as some kind of a definition. Okay, so I just want to start with some very basic definition, definitions. So, so that so k is find extension of QP and always going to be the valuation ring. So it's always a ZP algebra, it's a valuation ring. And um, so I see a comment in the Hello. chat. Welcome to the postgraduate program in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Okay, so always the local. I thought it was a number ring uh, of KF. Okay, so um yeah, so previously uh, O was, so we had O sub F, which is, you know, the number ring of the field of Fourier, Fourier coefficients. And then we actually localized that, we completed that, sorry, at uh, a prime ideal frac P. And that was O. You know, in this setting, we're just taking some, some valuation ring. Um, but in, in our applications, it's going to be the completion of the number ring at a prime ideal frac P. Um, okay, so I hope that was the only question. Okay, so 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 suppose we have our Galba representation from the absolute Galba group to GL two of O, and then we have the Bezier representation row bar. And the point is that now this Galba representation row, and, and you might think of something coming from Maunder form or maybe something coming from elliptic curve. This lies in a family of Galba representations, which are deformations of row bar. So I'm going to come to the notion of deformation of row bar in a second. The point is that a definition takes values in a certain like very large ring. 
So it's not necessarily ring as small as CP or O or something. It's something a lot bigger in general. So the type of rings we're looking at are rings which have a presentation of the following form. Um, so a coefficient ring is a ring which is a complete local noise theory in O algebra, such that when we look at the residue field, the residue field is isomorphic to F, where F uh, is just the residue field of O. So, okay, that's a lot of adjectives, but what we want to keep in mind is a ring which is the following form. It has a presentation of the following type. So we have a formal parsees ring in O, in, in M variables, and we're going modulo a number of relations. So this is basically the type of ring that we care about here. So what's an R lift of rho bar? An R lift is just a representation from the Gapsu Galba group, the GL2. Um, such that when we compose this, this, uh, this representation with the, uh, with the uh, after going modulo the maximum ideal, we recover rho bar. So we have this uh, representation of GL2 of R, and then we sort of go down to, we go modulo maximum ideal, we sort of recover rho bar. That's what an R lift is. And suppose we take two R lifts, uh, row one and row two. Um, then, I'm sorry, this is a typo. This should be GL2 of R. So two R lifts are strictly equivalent if they are conjugate by a matrix in GL2 of R, which sort of reduces to the identity, modulo maximum. So this is a typo that this spot, there should be an R. Yes, but this is just a notion of equivalence between two R lifts. Um, Okay, so a deformation is just a, an equivalence class of such lifts. It's kind of like a fancy word, but that's all it is. Just an equivalence class under this conjugation uh, equivalence. Okay, so, so we have our row bar and now when we want to define some, we want to look at some, um, the, we want to talk about the notion of a universal deformation. So in order to do that, we need to fix a finite set of primes S, which contains all the primes uh, uh, at which rho bar is ramified. So S is the finite set of primes containing the primes at which rho bar is ramified. In other words, rho bar is unramified away from S. Okay, so we fix such a set of primes and GS is gonna be the maximum quotient uh, of the absolute Galva group, which is unramified away from S. So this is just, so a homomorphism out of G, uh, taking values, a homomorphism, uh, so if the representation is going from GS to GLN, then that means that it's actually unramified away from S. So this is a little bit of mutation that actually helps us. Okay, so we fixed S, which is the set of primes where the representation is not ramified. And so when, once we fixed S, we get a universal definition. So what this means is that we have a homomorphism from GS to GL2 of R rho bar. So R rho bar is a coefficient ring such that if I, if I take any other deformation, come in, then, come it in, actually, then, then it actually arises from specialization. So any other, any other deformation rho sub r actually arises from this universal definition. So if I take any other deformation rho sub r, I can take the universal deformation here and then compose it with another map to basically obtain rho sub r. So in other words, basically, here, rho sub r is basically um, for every rho sub r, there exists a unique map from r sub rho bar to r, such that the composite is actually rho sub r. So, in other words, all so if I think of r sub rho bar, so if I take a look at spec of r sub rho bar, then all the r valued points on spec of r sub rho bar will correspond to the r valued definitions, rho sub r. So, it's like spec of r sub rho bar is sort of like scheme that parameterizes all the definitions of rho bar. So it's kind of like representing some mod, mod, uh, moduli problem. Yeah, so here R sub rho bar is called the universal definition. Um, so this is a really important point. I just want to check with the audience if this point is clear. Um, any questions about what I've said so far? So I'm just going to pause for a few minutes uh, if there are any questions.
Okay, so if there are no questions, let's continue. So the point is that we're trying to like abstractly recover the, you know, Hecke algebra by sort of, um, by using these definitions. And the point is that any definition is not necessarily going to come from modular form because the Galbraith conditions associated with modular forms have to have some additional properties. So they have to have some, you know, they have to sat satisfy some local chaotic or theoretic conditions at P, for instance, they have to be found finitely ramified, et cetera. So, um, so we have to uh, additionally impose some more conditions um, at, at every single prime. So this is where we, talk, we bring in local definition conditions. So rho bar sub L, remember, is the restriction of rho bar to the local decomposition group G sub L. And, and when we look at rho bar sub L, so this is a local gap representation, we can look at all the, we can consider all the definitions of rho bar sub L. So CLN of O is the category of coefficient rings. And we get a functor from CLN of O to sets. And this functor basically takes a, a coefficient ring R to the set of definitions of the local representation to R. So it's kind of functorial. So it takes R to the set. And a definition condition, C sub L, is just a sub functor of this, this functor of definition. So the full functor of definitions is def of L, def of L and C sub L is just a sub functor. So C sub L has to satisfy some extra conditions in order for it to be sort of um, representable and relatively representable, but I'm not gonna get into those details at this point. What I wanna say is that what this means is that for every R, we have a subset of def, def L of R, well, C L of R, and therefore like a local representation either lies in this set or not. So if it lies in the set, we see that it satisfies this local definition condition. So in this sense, it's kind of like imposing a condition um, for every prime L. So if it lies in the set C sub L of R, then we see it satisfies a local definition condition. Okay, so what is the definition type? So this is what we want to impose on our, on our global definitions. So we fix a set of primes sigma. So sigma is a set of primes outside of which rho bar is unwrapped. So in other words, rho, the definitions are um, allowed to ramify only in the set of prime sigma, which is finite. Furthermore, at every prime L in sigma, we sort of impose a local definition condition. So what that means is we, we only sort of specify certain definition, definitions at L to be admissible. So for example, um, if, you know, if the representations we can care about are ordinary at P, then we can sort of impose an ordinary definition condition. If they are flat at P, we can impose a flat definition condition. And then there are other types of definition conditions. These are all sort of sub functors of, you know, def. So I'm not going to specify exactly what the conditions are, but there are some conditions that should correspond to the Hecke algebra. Okay, so what does the Taylor Wiles method do here? So first up, we have an elliptic curve over Q, and then we want to pick a prime number P. So of course we don't want to pick P equals two. So let's pick P equals three. So now there are two cases to consider. The residue representation at three is absolutely reducible. So in other words, it's irreducible after passing to the algebraic closure of, uh, of FP, uh, algebraic closure FP bar. So in this case, it is known that bro bar actually arises from modular form. Um, so it lifts to something coming from modular form. And this is a result of Langlands and tunnel. Now in the other case, when bro bar is not absolutely reducible, then it's, a, it's, an art, it's, uh, it's due while so you can actually sort of replace the prime three with the prime five. Now, when you look at the residue representation of the prime five, you are actually okay. So this representation, this residue representation of five is actually, um, is actually modular. So this step is called the three five switch. Um, so it sort of reduces us to the case when we can assume that row bar is modular at the prime P. So being absolutely irreducible or not depends upon the elliptic curve, particular elliptic curve. Yeah, so it depends on the elliptic curve and the prime P. So this, this row bar is the Galbraith representation on EP, the P-torsional elliptic curve. 
So when the prime p is equal to three, we have to we look at the three torsion, which is just a two dimensional um, vector space over z mod three z. And we have the Galba action on that. So it not only depends on the curve, but also on the prime. So at three, we, it could be, so at three, for instance, it could be reducible, but at five, it could be irreducible, for instance. Um, which is what happens. And then it's for the prime three, right? Yes. Yes. Not for general prime. No, no. So like later on, this, um, so later on, like, so I mean, there has been a conjecture of SER, which states that if you're an absolutely reducible GAB replication, a uh, row bar, which is odd, then it, you know, it lifts to something coming from wonderful. And so this, this conjecture SER um, was conjectured for every prime P and it was settled by Karin Montenberg, but it was settled in 2009 or 2010. So much, much after these results were proved. So at the, at the time of Wiles, the result of Langlands and Tunnel was known for the prime three when row bar is absolutely reducible. And therefore Wiles had to make this three five switch. So if row bar at three is reducible, then you can actually sort of, you can, um, the, then, then if you look at the Swiss three with five, it actually becomes absolutely reducible and also modular. So there's, there's actually a lot of con. Switching to five so. guarantees the absolute yeah, so this this is where um, the semi-stable stability hypothesis is used. Um, so the after after doing the three five switch, um, it actually, I mean, so if it's reducible at three, it becomes irreducible at five. Uh, if it's semi-stable, if the elliptic curve is semi-stable. So okay, thanks. Yeah, so let me let me talk about how this you know, um, R equals T type of result is true in the minimal case. And then the non-minimal case is a little bit more complicated. So I'll explain what I mean at this point. So N naught is going to be the prime to P part of the Artin conductor of Robar. So this is kind of like the minimal level you can get for any, any modular form lifting Robar. Um, so it's kind of like called, it's called the minimal level for this reason. And associated to this minimal level n naught, we have the associated Hecke algebra. So we take this Hecke algebra generated by our Hecke operators, and uh, we specify the level to be n naught. And then once again, we localize it as a suitable maximum ideal. Just like we did before, we, we pick the suitable, ma suitable maximum ideal um, associated to row bar, and we localize it at this maximum ideal. So we get something that could potentially look like a definition. For instance, it's local, it's complete, it's not here, and it has all those, all those nice properties. On the other hand, what we can do is we can sort of specify a definition type, which is the minimal definition type. So here, S is a set of primes dividing N naught times P. So at every prime in S, we specify a local definition condition. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I mean, of course, I'm not gonna define what these conditions are exactly, but um, the point is that the residue representation um, has some representation theoretic properties at the primes away from P. And so the primes away from P use a definition condition called the Steinberg definition condition. And at the primes at, at P, you know, it can, um, because of semi-stability, it's, um, it's either flat, yeah. and use what's called the flat definition condition, or it's Selmer, uh, in which case you can sort of there's a very nice representation theoretic the choice of definition condition. So, I mean, one can actually specify these definition conditions uh, very precisely, but I'm not gonna do that in this lecture. I'm just gonna try and move on to the global argument here. The point here is that this, this R0 is sort of the universal definition associated to um, this, this definition type. So what that means is that any other definition satisfying all these conditions unramified away from S comes from a specialization of R0. So for example, we get one such representation coming from T0. So T0, you know, like going back to the construction of the Jacobian, T0 has its own GAB representation. Let's call that row prime. This GAB representation is shown to satisfy all of these local conditions. And as a result, it follows that basically as a result of universality, T naught also arises 
from a specialization of R0. Let's call this map phi R0. So we get a map from R0 to T0, which basically recovers this representation of the prime after specialization. So this is, this is the map phi naught at the minimal level. And now the objective is to show that this map is an isomorphism. So once you show that this map is an isomorphism, then you know, one can actually establish modularity. Um, of course, one has to show this map as isomorphism and also like an isomorphism for all other levels as well. But um, right now, let's talk about the minimal level. Okay. So um, yeah, so we the first step is to prove the isomorphism at the middle level, and then also to prove it at non-minimal levels as well. But the non-minimal level case requires a slightly more involved argument. So showing such an isomorphism between a definition ring and Hecke algebra is called R equals T term. So the definition ring is sort of like R, and the Hecke algebra is T, and then an isomorphism uh, between them is called an R equals T result. And you know this sort of uh, nomenclature is sort of used in more general situations. So like one does prove modularity statements for more general sort of Galra, higher dimensional Galra representations and so on. So this type of a statement is very ubiquitous in the literature since these results were first proved. Okay, so coming back to the, uh, back to, you know, what the whole purpose is here. So suppose you have elliptic curve and we have a definition ring R, not necessarily at minimal level, so the elliptic curve, the Galbraith representation associated elliptic curve is the same as the map from R to Z because it arises from the specialization of the definition ring by the universal property. Now, since R is isomorphic to T, which is the Hecke algebra, this is the same as a map from T to Z. But a map from T to Z, P is the same as a Hecke eigenform. So, a Hecke eigenform basically will take a Hecke operator to the scalar eigenvalue, so upon specialization. And it's not hard to show that any such algebra homomorphism actually arises from Hecke. So showing such an isomorphism will show that the initial gap representation arising from a map from R to ZP actually arises from a modular form, which is the same as the map from T to ZP. And this is why we want to show that R is isomorphic to T. Okay, so now the question is, how do we show that R is isomorphic to T? And this is where the Taylor Wiles argument comes in. So the idea here is that studying things at minimal level is very difficult. However, what one can do is one can allow for extra ramification at some auxiliary premise. So when one allows for definitions to be uh, to have more ramification at more auxiliary primes, called Taylor Wiles primes. Um, one can sort of, you know, the structure of these rings actually becomes a lot simpler to understand. And the idea eventually is to pass to some kind of an inverse limit um, after which these rings are fully understood. Okay, so this, this idea is a little bit complicated, but let me just try and go through it for the last 15 minutes of this lecture. So, a prime Q is called a Taylor Wiles prime if it satisfies the following conditions. Q is not in the set S, so remember that S is a set of primes dividing the Arden conductor times P. Q is also one mod P. And the last condition is that uh, rho bar at sigma of Q, so rho bar at the Frobenius is semi simple with distinct eigenvalues. So these conditions are sort of important uh, for the representation theoretic aspect of this. So now suppose Q is a set, capital Q is a set of uh, a finite, finitely many set of Taylor Wiles primes. And so associated with such a set capital Q, we can define a new deformation condition. So remember that the initial minimal deformation condition involved local conditions at the set of primes S, which were the set of primes dividing the Arden conductor. And now what we do is we, we add more deformation conditions at Q and what that means is we allow for more ramification. So initially, at the minimal, so the minimal definition condition, there was no ramification of the primes in Q. Now we're just allowing, in fact, we actually allowing any type of ramification in Q. So by allowing more ramification in Q, we actually get a larger definition ring. So R sub Q is going to be the associate definition ring for this new definition type. 
where we have more ramifications. And how is it related to the minimal defamation ring? There's actually a very nice relationship here. So what we do here is that, uh, what we do is that we let delta of Q be the P primary part of Z mod Q Z cross for Taylor Wells prime Q. And then let delta of capital Q be the product of all these, these groups delta of little Q. And now there's the map from R sub Q to R naught which comes from the universal property. And so what exactly this, is this map? So first of all, we can be shown that R sub Q is an O delta Q algebra. So not only is it an O algebra, but also admits an action of delta Q. And we let A sub Q be the augmentation ideal in this group algebra. So in other words, it's the ideal generated by all elements of the form G minus one, where G actually is in the group. So it's the augmentation ideal. And then when we take R sub Q and go modulo this R augmentation ideal, we actually recover the definition ring in minimal. So there's a very nice relationship between these two definition rings. Okay. So, the, so we can do this for the definition rings. We can also do it for the Hecke algebra. So once again, we can sort of, um, there's a very special congruence group we can, uh, over which we can look at Hecke operators and we can define Hecke al algebra associated to this definition type of DQ. And we call this T sub Q, we have to localize it as, as usual at some, some maximum ideal, which is associated to row bar. So this is, this is the Hecke algebra analog. And then again, what we can do is we can see that this Hecke algebra is an O delta Q algebra. And then when we go modulo the um, augmentation ideal, A sub Q, it satisfies the same property that we get, we get T naught. And finally, by the universal property, there's a map relating R sub Q and T sub Q. Let's call this map phi of Q. And so in that, this diagram actually commutes. Okay, so we, the point is that we get all these, we not only get, we not only get, we get this map down here, but we get another map up here for every choice of Q. And the idea is to try and show that these maps, phi sub Q are isomorphisms as after we pass through some kind of inverse limit. So this is where passion comes in. So, so, so here's the first statement, which is actually a very, very, um, I mean, this is a statement which has a lot of content to it. So this can be proved using some Galva cohomological arguments. So the statement is that given there, there exists, there exists an, a number R such that for every N grade equal to one, there's a set QN of Taylor Wells primes such that they are all of the form one mod P the N. So there is a number R such that for every N, there's a set QN of R Taylor Wells primes, which are all the form one mod P. So we can construct this special set of Taylor Wells primes, which are all of the form one mod P the N, all of which contain R elements for this fixed R. And we let RN be the associate definition ring associated to QN. And let TN be the associate definition ring associated to, uh, sorry, uh, TN be the Hecke algebra associated to QN by the uh, recipe specified before. Now, given QN, we can, we can construct QN plus one in such a way that there are some maps from RN plus one to RN and TN plus one to TN. Um, and yeah, so I, this is again a typo, sorry. So these are not natural maps. I was, I was going to say not natural, but this is a typo again. They are not natural maps. Um, the point is we can get these, these, these maps relating them uh, such that the following diagram can. So once again, the horizontal maps are obtained um, by the universal property. So the idea is we can sort of like go up a tower. So, so Rn and Tn are both algebras over this uh, group algebra, which we can uh, represent as follows, O of S1 to SR, modulo these relations. So here, as n varies, we can see that the power at which you're raising one plus S1 all the way to one plus SR, SR actually becomes larger. So here, the PDN becomes larger as n becomes larger. So if you take the inverse limit of all of these, all of these rings, um, we actually get a formal power C's ring and 
in our variables overall. The point is that all of these relations are going to zero periodically as n goes to infinity. So we, when we take the inverse limit, we get a formal power series ring in our variables. And the point is that this formal power series ring has a very simple structure compared to you know, a ring like O delta n. So what we do is we take the inverse limit of these, um, of these deformation rings, we take the inverse limit of these Hecke algebras. So R infinity is the inverse limit of these deformation rings under these, these maps, and T infinity is the inverse limit of these Hecke algebras. So I can see some questions. What is the relationship between QN and QM if N is less than M? Is there any relation? Yeah, so that's a very good question. There is no, there is no, so QN and QM are completely disjoint. The definition rings and the Hecke algebras are not related to each other by any kind of functorial properties whatsoever. But the idea here is that once you have QN, then you can construct QN plus one such that there is a map relating you know, Rn plus one with Rn. And so this, this map is highly non-canonical. It sort of arises from the fact that um, given, a, given, given N, there are basically like, I mean, there, there are gonna be only finitely many um, isomorphism classes of, of um, you know, Rn for a given N. And um, it involves the fact that we have infinitely many choices with QN plus one. So therefore, you know, you'll be able to sort of recover your choice. I mean, it's some kind of pigeonhole principle argument that you're using at this point, but it's not, it's not a natural construction of it. Um, there's no functorial relationship between um, Rn plus one and Rn. Okay, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but um, that was a really good question. Okay. Um, right. So. Okay. So 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 we we pass through these inverse limits, and now things actually become simpler because now there there are actually algebras over O infinity, which is a formal power series ring. Okay. And once again, we once we pass through the inverse limit, we get a map relating them. So this is the inverse limit of all the maps phi n. And this is a map of O infinity algebras. So now the point is, if we show that phi infinity is an isomorphism, then it follows that the, the map that we started off with is also an isomorphism. So notice that R naught is R infinity modulo S1 to SR. So here S1 to SR generates this augmentation ideal. And T infinity, uh, T naught is T infinity modulo S1 to SR. So if R infinity is isomorphic to T infinity, um, then it follows that when you go modulo S1 to SR, you still get an isomorphism. So the initial initial map that you want to show is the isomorphism, you know, uh, you actually have shown that it's an isomorphism after you go up, um, if you, after you pass this inverse limit. Okay. So now, now why, why is this map phi infinity and isomorphism? So the point is that the Hecke algebras acts, act on spaces of modular forms. So Tn acts on a space of modular forms, which is finally generated in free as an O delta N module. And when you, so let Mn be the space of modular forms on which Tn acts. So let M infinity be the inverse limit of these, these Mn's. Now M infinity is also gonna be finally generated in free as an O infinity. So T infinity acts on M infinity in a faithful way. So T infinity also has to be finitely generated and faithful as an O infinity model. So T infinity is just gonna be an integral extension of O infinity. Um, on the other hand, one can, it follows from, you know, some very, um, some arguments in definition theory, some Galba theoretic arguments that R infinity is generated by R elements. So it's, it's the quotient of O of X1 to XR modulo some ideal. Okay, so as a result of this, what we see is that T infinity has, you know, dimension, you know, R plus one, right? And this map is surjective. That can be, that is not difficult to show that this map is surjective. T infinity has dimension R plus one and R infinity has dimension less than, less than equal to R plus one because it's a quotient of this ring. And so therefore by dimension considerations, both the only possibility is that 
both R infinity and T infinity are basically isomorphic to O of X1 to XR. Because if it's if R infinity is not isomorphic to O of X1 to XR, the dimension will be less than T infinity. Right? But this map is rejected. So that is not possible. So the only possibility is that R infinity is actually just isomorphic to O of X1 to XR. Right? But then because this map is rejective, it also means that uh, T infinity has to be isomorphic to R infinity. So it comes down to a complicated algebra argument, which is not difficult at all. Um, but the main ingredient here was the fact that T infinity acts faithfully um, on this on the space of order forms um, when you go to the inverse limit. So phi infinity is an isomorphism from which we actually recover, um, we actually are able to show that uh, phi naught is an isomorphism at the minimal level. Okay, so I guess the last thing that I should see at this point is uh, that, um, and uh, you know, I just have a few minutes, but what I should say here is that when we are sort of trying to prove an isomorphism at non-minimal levels as well, I mean, it involves like a more technical argument, but it's like the deformation ring at the non-minimal level is sort of related to the deformation ring at the minimal level. So you try and understand sort of like the difference between these deformation rings in a certain sense, and you sort of try and understand the difference between the Hecke algebras in a certain sense. And so you have an isomorphism between um, the minimal deformation ring and the minimal Hecke algebra, and you try and propagate that to the non-minimal case as well. And then when you have this isomorphism for uh, R between R and T, um, that's where the modularity actually comes up. Okay, yeah, so I, that's, that's all I had prepared today. So um, thank you so much. Um, and I hope this was actually useful um, for this for this lecture series. Thank you, Anvez. Beautiful talk. If people have questions, please uh, do ask. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. I want to ask uh, about the lifting conditions. Means, means okay. about the lifts. Rowbar means you are saying rowbar uh, rowbar is unified outside S. Means in general yes. in deformation, can we have some deformation condition on the lift actually? Means because lift has some more ramifications. Uh -huh. Can we fix that? Means some S prime. Yes, yes, yes. So and then I think so. I think what you're asking is so um right. So 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 deformation datum. Let's go back to definition of the definition datum. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, there's actually like a lot of it's a slightly technical uh talk which I haven't like precisely defined everything, but yeah. okay. So what is the definition datum here? So this datum, so this, this calligraphic D is going to sort of um, give us conditions yeah. on our global definition. So here's sigma is a set of primes yeah. uh, outside which row bar is on ramified. Okay. So for instance, yeah. so, 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 so yeah, so sigma it's, so for instance, let's say row bar is ramified at two and three, right? Now sigma yeah. can contain many more primes other than two and three, but it yeah. but it has to contain two and three. So that is the first thing. But the point is that the larger sigma is, the more ramification you're allowing. So for instance, if sigma is like two, oh, three, yeah. five, seven, that means you're allowing ramification at five and seven as well as two and three. And yeah. you have to have two and three in there because row bar itself is ramified at two and three. Now, the point is that once you have this set of prime sigma, then basically at every prime in sigma, we have a local definition condition on top of that. Okay. So for instance, like suppose your primes are two, three, five, seven, mm -hmm. and so your row bar is ramified at two and three, it doesn't mean that you have to look at all definitions of two and three. You can actually still specify certain, like uh, certain, certain local conditions at two and three at which row bar is ramified. So, for instance, you can uh, you can prescribe what's called the minimal definition condition, or there's a you can prescribe some other definition condition. You can prescribe the you can sort of allow for all definitions, you know. Okay. So CL, for instance, could be all of DFL, or it could be something smaller. So like there is one way to think about this is that the set of all definition conditions you can, you can think of it as some kind of a scheme, and uh, and your CL is some kind of closed substrate inside that scheme. So for instance, if the prime is P, for instance, then let's say your, your ambient scheme has certain a certain dimension. 
and let's say your ordinary, your, your definition condition could be all ordinary lifts. So that would be a substring. But there could be a there could be a totally different definition condition like crystalline lifts or something, right? So there's a different substring. So like the CL is like, you know, uh, like it's it's like a sub scheme. It's like you, you're choosing certain types of lifts as like admissible. So it doesn't, it 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 could it could be something in between, you know, all definitions and just the unramified ones, you know, for instance. Um yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's yeah, yeah. I mean, I ask this question from a different perspective, actually. It means uh -huh. in, in the kind of Faulting's theorem, Faulting's finiteness theorems, right. means, uh, means finitely many representations, if representations are unified outside some S, if we fix S, means. So, means in that sense, I just ask, means if we have some more, if, uh -huh. if we fix some S prime also, means robot uh -huh. ramification is S, some bigger uh -huh. S prime, S prime contains S, means can we fix right. that and can we ask such type of questions? Means, yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's an interesting question. The point here is that, like, when you're when you're fixing row bar and you're fixing s, you're yeah. sort of, you know, you have a lot of, I mean, yeah. So I guess I guess you're talking about the number of row bars that can exist and ratified yeah. outside the fixed. Yeah, that's so what we're doing. Yeah. Is you're fixing row bar and then you're looking at all the lifts of row bar. Yeah, how so, many lifts can be possible? Yeah, yeah. So that is that's that, slightly yeah. different. Yeah, it's a slightly different type of question. Okay. Um, I mean, all the lifts are actually like lifting our fixed row bar, for instance. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, but I think like this question about how many row bars are there unratified outside of seven prime S. Um, yeah, I mean, if we actually, have the row bars, then how many rows are there up to isomorphism? If we fix the S, some S prime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, 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 this sort of thing, uh, you know, it comes up in the theory of like, um, Eigenvarieties per one. Like for Studio? instance, like what eigenvarieties. Eigenvarieties. Eigenvarieties, okay. Yeah. So like when you sort of so in definition theory, you're fixing a row bar and then looking at all the definitions of a fixed row bar. But now when you're constructing, so if you want to look at all the row bars which are sort of unramified, you know, out outside S, then yeah. you have a number of different sort of um you have a number of finitely many choices, and then basically all of you know all of their definitions together form all, all the definition species together form a variety called the eigenvariety. Um, so it has you some more structure. Uh, you mentioned this that Q also means Q also there you're adding some extra primes Q. I mean Taylor Wells prime you yes. mentioned means yes yes. So is there something minimal thing or? It's, uh, it's yeah. So, so the point is that, that, that you, you're trying to you're trying to prove r equals t at the minimal level, and okay. you cannot prove that. You're not able to prove that directly. So oh. the way to do this is to sort of keep adding more, like like adding some extra primes q to the level. So q is some set of extra primes that you add to the level. Now, you sort of have, you sort of um, so for instance, q one basically consists of all primes. A set of primes which are all one mod p. Q two consists of a set of primes which are all mod one mod p square. Q three is a set of primes all one mod p cube. So, but yeah. they all have the same size and they're all sort of mutually disjoint from each other. Okay, okay. So, okay. like, it's like you're sort of doing this in such a way that you're sort of like uh, the everything is like sort of periodically going to zero, and so your r infinity and t infinity are sort of algebras over this power series ring and. Over these power series rings, it's actually easier to sort of prove uh, results using from the algebra. That's kind of like the idea behind the Taylor Wiles method. Yeah, but it is mysterious how exactly they're related to each other. It is a very sort of these maps relating, let's see, Rn plus one to Rn, for instance, are very non canonical. Okay. So, but that was that was uh, those were really awesome questions. Um, so, thank you. The Taylor Wiles original method had some more subtle commutative algebra, Co Cohen Macaulay rings, and so on. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So a, a large part of this been yeah, simplified so, over the years. Yeah, so uh, after uh, right. So after uh, doing all of this. Um, so after doing all of this, we we have to add not only able to show that 
the definition ring and the Hecke algebra uh, are isomorphic, but we also know something about their presentations. So we know, for instance, your, your R infinity is O of X1 to XR, and so is T infinity, they're isomorphic. But now you sort of go back to R naught, and so it's O of X1 to XR modulo S1 to SR. So, you know, you have the same number of generators and relations. So this is called the complete intersection problem. So that, that is a result of, of this method. Um, but I mean, again, there are a lot of technical points in this whole proof, which I've sort of put under the carpet, for instance, like, um, like the semi-stability is used throughout and then proving these results at the non-minimal level is also something that I've not talked about much. Um, so I mean, all of these, there's a lot, there's a lot of technical, um, there's, a, there's a lot lot more to be sort of unraveled. For application to of, elliptic curves, semi-stable elliptic curves, you need uh, minimal or not necessarily minimal level? Uh, no, no, so, um, right. So the, the semi-stability is used in various places. For instance, in like um, the three fire switch step, and also in prescribing the definition conditions at P. Um, there are many other steps in which it is required. But um, the thing here is that we first prove the isomorphism between R and T at the minimal level um, using this method. And then you sort of propagate that eventually to non-minimal levels as well. Um, and that requires more work beyond well, this. My question was whether uh, R equals T needs to be proved for application to elliptic, semi-stable elliptic curves for non-minimal case also, or only the minimal case? Perhaps non-minimal case. Uh, R equals T needs to be proved, yeah, in in both cases, yeah. For, yeah, for semi FLT? Yes, yes. Those are non-minimal? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, so the, for the application to FLT, so you have your Fry curve, right? And the the property of the Fry curve is that its conductor is large, but the res, the octane conductor of the residue representation is very small. Mm. So it's, I mean, the conductor of the elliptic curve is highly non-minimal. Um, like, and um, so, so proving R equals T at minimal level is not enough. You have to prove R equals T at the non-minimal level as well. Um, eventually, the argument. So, one of the main um, components of this argument is the level lowering theorem of the bit. So, um, of course, so you have your Fry curve giving rise to your um, giving giving rise to um, this. So, so you, you start with your Fry curve, um, and then you look at the residue representation of the Fry curve. The residue representation has very small arc and therefore by the bit's level lowering, uh, you sort of know that this is coming from, um, I mean, so, so therefore you can actually level lower. And eventually you sort of get a modular form. Um, I think it's basically a modular form of weight two on gamma naught of two, which does not exist. The point is that you can sort of, after using the level lowering step, you actually get a modular form uh, on gamma naught of two. Um, and it's such such a thing. Uh, and, I mean, I mean, basically, you don't get you don't have such a model form. There doesn't exist such a model form. So the level lowering step is also used um, there. But yeah, but for establishing modularity of the elliptic curve to begin with, you do need R equals two at the non-minimal in the non-minimal um, case as well. Yeah. Good. All right. Could you suggest some references for introductory and for yeah. recent development yeah. in 20 yeah. years? Yeah. So I think, I, I mean, I, I did this lecture with uh, the hope that, you know, like eventually in this, in this course, um, all of these notions will be developed in, more, uh, in a more systematic way. Um, and so, for instance, I would suggest looking at, I mean, the main reference um, is, of course, uh, at a graduate level would be uh, modular forms in Fermat's last term. 
So that's like a textbook which sort of grew out of the um, uh, out of the Boston seminar, which sort of uh, took place, you know, a while after Andrew Wells uh, proved the result. Like that, um, so that is some conference yes. you are saying, right? Yes, it's exactly. So it's, it's, it's a Springer book, which is uh, which basically is based on the Boston um, Boston conference. Um, so, so that is definitely one reference. Um, I, I did look at, I did look through some parts of Wiles' paper once, um, but again, like a lot of the paper is, is kind of difficult to follow. Um, but then, yeah, but I think that book actually goes through this um, in, a, in, in a good amount of detail. So while going for the modularity from Q to other totally number, real number field, we need the Hilbert modular form. So what are the status of these theorems? Like um, Wiles lifting theorem for those stuff for abelian variety? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, so uh, first of all, I think, there isn't much known for abelian varieties. Are I there think there are some, there's some work, there's some like recent work done for abelian surfaces, but the picture is like far from complete for abelian surfaces. I think there are some results of George Boxer and others um, on, on, on this topic. Um, and then for totally real fields, I think, I think that is a situation which you know, a lot more is known. So I, I, I know that the level lowering theorem is more or less known, I think, in the totally real fields case. And there's also, I think one can, for looking, I think the modularity theorem is also known. I think the reference would be uh, certain people, there's some papers of Fujiwara on the totally real field version of, um, Fritas, of these types of papers. No, no, Fritas has proved this over the quadratic number field, right? Modularity. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I think, I'm, I mean, I'm not at the top of my head, I'm not, I don't remember like what the literature is on totally real fields, but I think as far as remember, like I went through um, some, some parts of Fujiwara's papers and he, he seems, I think he was, in my opinion, I, I thought, I mean, I felt like he had proved a lot of the statement, but I, I might be wrong about this. But yeah, so um, I would start with Fujiwara and see what he says about the state of the art there and just, just look at some papers that might, you know, um, might be sort of uh, citing his paper. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know anything beyond that, but. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, we will check. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand why you want to. Why you might be interested in the totally real fields case because yeah, basically Darman's um, program discusses the model yeah. of abelian variety or those fields. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So um, yeah, that would be something to look into, of course. Um, okay, thanks. I mean, the level lowering term is definitely like very important um, in 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 those results. I'm sure. All right, very well. If uh, there are no more other questions, then let's thank Anvesh again and uh, we end the meeting now. So, thank you, Anvesh. Very good talk. Thank you. Anvesh. And thank you. You are in the UBC. You, what is the local time? Four a.m. Oh, it's uh, it's around three forty-five. I mean. Uh, that's really inconvenient hour for you. I am. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's not that inconvenient because the semester is not started yet, okay. so I don't have to teach any class tomorrow. Thankfully. Okay. So, okay. Um, All right. Okay. So on the, I hope you can sleep. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you. So I think uh, right. that's it. that's it for the moment. Bye. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so for much. sharing the session. Of course. Yeah. Yes. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Yes. Uh, so put uh, Devendra, please put off this thing. I mean.